all-new Dr. Phil. He's 26 and still lives at home. My son is unmotivated, sloppy, lazy. And his room is a complete pigsty. So they cut him some slack? He got a job trimming marijuana plants and then had to see a psychiatrist for hallucinations. Or kick him to the curb. How'd you get him to do this? To make such a mess? I didn't. He did not come out of the womb and start throwing stuff around the delivery room. Let's do it. It's a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by, Dr. Phil. I try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. In five, four. I am not giving up on you. Go, Dr. Phil. today has had nine jobs, been fired from at least four, quit the others, has been out of work for months at a time, and barely makes minimum wage. Other than that, he's got it going on. <laughs> he's on the speedboat, four cars, a computer, a cell phone, lives in a nice house, and has even flown on a private plane. How does he afford all of this? Well, take a guess. <laughs> Old mom and dad just step right up. They say their son is 26 years old, living at home, with no real plans to leave anytime soon. Why would he? Take a look. I'm 26 years old and currently still living with my parents. My son Christopher is unmotivated, sloppy, lazy. He doesn't shower on a regular basis. His BO is often overwhelming. He does not brush his teeth regularly. I have a couple of cavities that I've known about for like a year or more. I know that Christopher smokes pot, drinks alcohol, he's smoking cigarettes, and it's really bad for him because he has diabetes. Chris is a total slob, and his room is a complete pigsty. He has food, papers, old receipts, energy drink containers, syringes from his insulin, and it's just spread all over the floor. He just walks over it. They expect me to clean my room, which bugs me, because I feel like it's my space. My husband and I pay for everything. We pay the mortgage, we pay the power, we pay his cell phone. Christopher did have a vehicle, and he quit making the payments. We took over the payments for him. My one request of him as a way of paying rent is to keep the kitchen clean. He doesn't do it. I really don't like cleaning. kitchen when you tell me to do it. My point is, Christopher, that I don't think it's unreasonable as your share of the household chores. I don't either. So I don't understand why you don't do it. I do do it. Just not always when you want me to. I have to treat Christopher like a child. Our biggest fear is that we're going to end up taking care of him for the rest of his life, and we're desperate for help. Well, Christopher wasn't always lazy, as they now call him. In fact, his parents say he was a model child destined for greatness. Christopher growing up was extremely smart and motivated. My son Chris showed lots of creativity, intelligence, and promise. He carried a 3.85 GPA all the way through high school. When Christopher was 12, he was one of only 2,000 kids selected from worldwide to go to Disneyland as a Millennium Dreamer. When he was in grade school, he was chosen most likely to succeed. When Christopher was a child, we never really had to punish him. He would listen to what we told him to do. He usually was quick to do it, and we never really had to come up with any punishments for him. I've always felt that Christopher has the potential to do whatever he wanted. Okay, so let's just jump right into this. Three, one, two, three. Now adults have conspired to cripple this guy. How old are you? 26. 26. <laughs> So you're an adult. I, I've seen doctors that are 26. I've seen airline pilots that are 26. This is your, where your son is living in. Is this your house? Yes, it is. You, yeah. you own it? Pay for it? We're paying yeah. for it, yeah. Yeah. But he's living there. I don't know. Tell me, does that look like high-functioning No. And I, my problem is I don't know how to get him to clean his room. Well, how'd you I mean, get I'm, him to do this? get him to make such a mess? Yeah. I didn't. He did not come out of the womb and start throwing stuff around the delivery room. No, you're right, he didn't. And when he was younger, his room was clean. Well, I... When he was, when he well, was 
younger, his room was clean. When he felt like he had that's to do what his asking, parents... That's why I'm asking, how did you get him to do this? I didn't do anything. I mean, that's it. I let him be an adult. And that's what his room looks like. If I harp on him, if I get upset with him, he just says, I'm an adult, I should be able to... If my room is a pigsty, that's my business. And I don't know how you can look, force him to clean it. Look at all the stuff. I did some of it. I mean... No, oh, you did all of it. I'm just wondering how it is they got you to think that was okay. Well, I was really, I, off and on, am really busy. We lead kind of a crazy lifestyle. Uh, you know, like, for a while, I was working at a hospital, midnight to 8 a.m., in an ER, so I was really stressed out. And the last thing I want to do when I come home from something like that is clean my room or the kitchen. And Apparently. <laughs> but, Christopher, you haven't had a job, for, that hospital job, for a year now. You have hours every day that you could clean your room if you wanted to. Yeah. Hey, hey look. <laughs> look, I've raised two boys. I get it. Do you sit in your room at night and laugh your ass off at what you're getting away with? No. You don't? You seriously? No. You don't chuckle? at controlling them in this way? No, because I feel like it's my room. It's not your room. It's their space. You're allowed to stay there. That's a privilege. See, at 18, you become an adult. And whatever happens after that is their gift to you. They don't owe you this. They don't owe you a roof. They don't owe you money. They don't owe you food. They don't owe you comfort. You're an adult. Right? So how is this, how is this your room and how is this your space? It's, it's the space that I reside in. I, it's my private area that I expect my parents to knock before they come into my room and that I keep it the way I want it for the most part. I mean, I'm not forced to keep it any specific way. Like, I don't mind stepping on my clean clothes or dirty clothes. But why don't you mind? Well, mostly I don't mind because when I want to have somebody over, I clean it up. He never cleans it up. Uh, your room has looked like that from the first week we moved into the house. Okay. How is that okay with you it's guys? It's not okay with it, us. Oh, based on results, <laughs> it is okay. That's not true either. I do clean you know, it up. I mean, we have argued with him about it. We ha I well, but now argue with me. How is this okay with you, Dad? You're the dad. Most powerful role model in any child's life is the same-sexed parent. You. Does your room look like that? No. But you allow his room to look like that, and it's a place you're allowing him to stay. He is a guest in your home. Yes. Correct? That's how I feel. Or do you think you owe him this because he's no. your kid no. and he's diabetic? I don't feel that we owe him that, but we're kind of at a loss at... We're afraid you know. of what will happen okay. if we give him an ultimatum. All right, let's, let's talk about him like he's not here for a minute. Okay. okay. Are we agreed this isn't working? Yes, yes, definitely. Are we agreed that the manner in which he is conducting himself is not acceptable to you? Yes. yes. But do you have the fundamental right to determine who lives in your home? Yes. I believe I do. Okay, and do you have the fundamental right to require of people who live in your home to conduct themselves in a manner consistent with your values? Yeah, I think certainly. So it's like you were renting me a room and you came in and it looked like that room did? Would that be okay with you? No. Or would you be nailing an eviction notice to my door? We've actually had that conversation before. Okay, I understand you've had it a lot, <laughs> but you've never done doodly squat about it. No. You just have the conversation. Right. I'm... I'm too concerned about what would happen to him if we do that. I, I get it. I get it because he's a diabetic, right? And you understand, diabetes is not a disability. I know. It's a disease. What type of job would keep Christopher content? Uh, why does he have such a problem with steady work? Is his problem with authority? I, I don't know. I'm going to ask him. I'm going to find out. Because I can tell you, he is a very bright young man. We'll be right back. nine different jobs. I've been fired from four of them. The first job I was fired from, they told me I wasn't working hard enough, which just didn't make any sense. The hospital fired me for waking up late 
they treat attendance fairly seriously at an ER. Yeah. Monday on an all new Dr. Phil from Fairy Tale. He was my Prince Charming. To Nightmare. He rips my will to live from me. With so much resentment. He says his biggest regret is he ever got you pregnant. And hostility. This isn't a one side beat down because you can yell and swear with the best of them. Can there be a happy ending? I don't know what the right choice is. How about you kick him to the curb? That's Monday. Okay, they say the average adult will have approximately seven jobs throughout his or her lifetime. Well, Christopher has already blown through nine jobs, the ones that he can remember. Let's hear how. I currently work part-time at a juice bar. Before he got this job, he'd had quite a few jobs. I've had nine different jobs, and I've been fired from four of them. Well, the first job I was fired from, they told me I wasn't working hard enough which just didn't make any sense. The hospital fired me for waking up late. They treat attendance fairly seriously at an ER. Best Buy, I had some weird conflict with a supervisor, and then the casino just didn't work out, and I pretty much let myself get fired. To my knowledge, Christopher usually gets fired because he doesn't show up for work on time. Well, although Christopher says he'd like a full-time job, he's not as eager to take extra work at the juice bar. I work about three days a week, six-hour shifts. When they called the other day and asked you to, to uh, pick up another shift, why didn't you take it? I need to be able to prepare because I, I don't want to change what I'm doing but right what, now on the What fly. are you doing that's so important that you can't pick up another shift to make more money? Recovering, they... taking care of myself. Recovering from? From the last couple of days of stress. So what's stressing you that you have to recover from? Work? Work and crashing my car. Falling, getting hurt. Crashing your car and falling and getting hurt all happened a long time ago. Right, so I rolled my car across the freeway at 65 miles an hour, and uh, that was after getting fired from a job and a couple of days of stress. Well, that was 2011. Yeah. But Christopher says he's still recovering from what he's now describing, although it happened, I guess, coming up on three years ago now on a road trip to Mexico. T take a look. When I went to Mexico, my parents told me that if I needed help, not to ask for them. He lost his job the week he was going to go. We tried to convince him not to, and on the way home, fell asleep at the wheel, totaled his car. Went off the side of the freeway, rolled and spun, and then called my parents and basically begged my parents to help me, and they transferred 300 bucks to my credit card. We had to buy him a bus ticket, and then we had friends in Arizona who have a small plane, so they put him on his, their plane and flew him up to Sacramento, and my husband had to drive over there and pick him up. Even though they said they wouldn't help me, they did come through. They give me some idle threats, and they don't usually follow through with them. Well, your mom says you sit around and smoke pot and drink alcohol. That's not true. That is true. I mean, I could tell um, you how many times... She says your we, friends are guys who live on other friends' couches and party all the time and live on marijuana cards. That's not true either. They, they have their own places for the most part. I mean, the, She says you got a job trimming marijuana plants <laughs> and then had to see a psychiatrist for hallucinations. I went to see the psychiatrist after other problems, other stress. I mean... We could say it was drug-related. She said you got wasted every night on a family cruise six years ago, and she was too worried to sleep because being a diabetic and being drunk is obviously dangerous, which of course it is. They had to quit the family camping trips because you would get too drunk in the woods. 
Yeah, we'd about be out at the lake in the middle of nowhere, and he would get so drunk that we never if left. he went into an emergency, if it was an emergency. No, you didn't say you left. You said he quit taking the trip. No, I quit going <coughs> because I couldn't deal with the stress of it. I couldn't watch him like that. Now, you guys have actually made excuses for his unemployment. I read everything, so I went through <laughs> and made a collection of these. You said, well, he doesn't have a regular routine. He's just too screwed up from his schedule. Yeah, he doesn't get sleep. He's up all night. He sleeps all day. And he's sleep he's... deprived, which is not good for his yeah, health. So you yeah. don't want to wake him up to go to work. I mean, he needs sleep. He's, yeah, you said he just tends to rub people the wrong way. Sometimes, yeah. I know if he talks to people at work the way he talks to us, I'm, that's going to rub people yeah. the wrong way. You say lazy, not motivated by money, and corporations are killing people. The economy is tough. Why does he need a job? Because he needs to move out. He's got a place to live. He's got money and people taking care of him, right? Yeah. Look, you came here for help, right? Yes. yes. We got to start with some fundamental beliefs here. Number one, you don't owe him a living. Th that's a non-starter because if, you, if you're parenting from guilt, if you think you owe him a living, that you're responsible for him independent of what he may or may not do, then it's non-starter. There's no point in even having the rest of the conversation. No, I don't think we owe him. Right, we're just scared of what will happen if he's not there. I get that. So what you're saying is you're, you no longer care what's good for him. You're doing what you're doing to allay your own fears. What you're saying is you're either going to do what he needs to do to get where he needs to be, but that could be scary, and you don't want to deal with that fear, so you allow him to not clean his room for a year <laughs> so you don't have anxiety. I never really thought of it that way. I really just thought of his safety, you know, what my concern for him. Your concern. Yes, my concern for yeah. him. Coming up, Lori and David are worried their son may have a mental disability. We'll hear why when we come back. Paramex have had to come to my home because of my diabetes at least five or six times. He's convulsing on the floor, he's foaming at the mouth. I mean, it, it's terrifying. This November. A former UFC fighter arrested for allegedly beating his wife. He would have killed her that night if she hadn't left. Shut up. You're so annoying. This is the mother that's raising your children. Yeah, great for her. She's the one that took them from me. Is she beating the odds? I have 12 titles in weightlifting, and I have cancer. Or making stuff up. My mom never had cancer. You said that you lost 100 pounds in six days. You can't lose 100 pounds in six days unless they're cutting off body parts. Did their son's girlfriend kill him? You believe she knew he had overdosed and didn't tell you? Yes. Did you wait 45 minutes to get us to make sure that he was dead? No. You are lying. Tell the truth. That's You're psychotic. You need to be in a ward. My mom, she's an evil person. They say they are not allowed to visit their dying father. That is not true. If he wanted to see you, he'd call you. You are so hostile. Is mom keeping them from their dying dad? Do you want a relationship with your children? Of course. Are you okay with me calling them? Stop asking for permission to talk to them. This November on Dr. Phil. Christopher's the oldest of three children. My daughter, who's 25, Alex, she goes to school full-time and works part-time. My daughter, Jessie, is a baker. They both moved out of the house when they were about 18. But because of the diabetes, my wife did devote more attention to him. My son, Chris, suddenly was the center of attention for my entire family. I don't know why Christopher is different than my daughters. I don't know. Well, Lori says despite raising her three children the same, Christopher's diabetes has always made him special. I'm supposed to check my blood sugar roughly four times a day, and I actually check my blood sugar less than once a day. There are days where I don't check my blood sugar. Christopher has had several seizures because he doesn't monitor his blood sugar well. Paramedics have had to come to my home because of my diabetes at least five or six times. He had a seizure the morning of my daughter's wedding. He's convulsing on the floor. He's foaming at the mouth. I mean, it, it's terrifying, but that didn't stop him from going out that night and getting totally drunk. After he's had one of those seizures, he doesn't remember it even happening. 
because he's not taking care of himself. If we weren't there, I feel like he would end up dead in a ditch somewhere or something. Well, Lori and David worry so much about Christopher's diabetes, they wonder if his seizures have actually caused him to be mentally disabled. I do have concerns that Christopher's diabetic seizures have affected him mentally. Every time someone goes into insulin shock, it's a lack of oxygen to the brain. He seems lazy and unmotivated, but he could have a serious mental issue that is undiagnosed. At one point, he came home one day, was kind of paranoid. He had some kind of psychotic break. He was spending a lot of time talking about patterns. So then this whole panic thing came up about, oh my God, is he schizophrenic? I would get really excited about seeing patterns in information that other people would see as meaningless. I also learned that I've been tripping myself out by taking drugs. He used to be a fun, outgoing kid who had a lot of friends, and now he's socially awkward. So it makes sense to me that something might be wrong mentally. Okay, uh, you, you did hear him say that he's not even managing his own diabetes, right? Right. Yes. Right, you said you're supposed to check your blood sugar four times a day. You said you check it less than once. Yeah, I don't check it as often as other people tell me I should. Okay, so... But I am in good control. He, but he's not even doing that. Right. And, and you're saying we can't put him out of the house. He's diabetic, right? That's our fear. Well, I mean, come on, listen. There have been a lot of people with diabetes that seem to get along fairly okay. Right. Uh, here's a few. Jackie Robinson... Mary Tyler Moore, Chris Dudley, NBA player, Thomas Edison, Nick Jonas, Brett Michaels, uh, Halle Berry, David Crosby. All right, I know there's lots of Oh, there's, there's one take more. Care. There's one more on the list. Oh, Dr. Didn't Phil. Know that. Didn't know that, Dr. Phil. <laughs> you have such a different approach to this than I think is productive and I think it is warranted. You know, I've been doing this show for 13 years, and I hired my executive producer 14 years ago. And I was with her the day she got the phone call that said her son was a diabetic. This is Carla in the control room. Say hello to Carla Pennington, the best executive producer in television. So Carla, as a diabetic mother to a diabetic mother, what do you hear and see? And how did you respond to this? I, you remember I was with you the moment you got the call. Yes, and I did go into a panic, but you told me not to treat him any differently. And so I've done that every day since. And that was, he was two and a half, and he's now 14. That was him on when he graduated eighth grade. So... Um, but he takes care of himself, and I do not let him make one excuse. And by the way, uh, Christopher, he checks himself six times a day. Okay. And here he is playing so he soccer. soccer. He plays yeah. tennis. tennis. Yeah, he's, he's very, very active. He's, he's on insulin athletic. pump. Christopher used to be that way. When he hit about 21, I think he felt like he didn't need to listen to us anymore. Okay. So if he didn't want to take care of it, he didn't have to. Well, I, I kind of resented sometimes my mom trying to forced me to check my blood sugar at a specific point like she wanted me to check my blood sugar before i went to bed every night and then sometimes she would wake me up in the middle of the night to have me check my blood sugar and i would say to, to Lori's credit that when they were when he was first diagnosed with diabetes we did try to not treat him differently it, it became a big deal but we really did try to treat them all the same and 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 raise them all all three of our Look, children i'm not saying don't pretend that the disease doesn't exist because right. it certainly right. does right. and no. it needs to be acknowledged i mean uh I, in fact I, i've put together a graphic for everybody at home to look at the steps that that carefully describe uh what you should do i mean parents should start their education immediately take some time to get used to this encourage self-care but don't be a pest Make changes together, set small goals, work with the, the diabetes care team and find support for yourself. We'll have a link to this on our website so people can click on it and read what's under those things. But the point is, diabetes is a disease. It's not a disability. It's not an right. excuse. It's not a reason to not require someone to do everything that they're capable of. Tell me what diabetes has to do with cleaning up a room. It has nothing to what do does it have to do with brushing teeth? It has nothing to do with it. The only what does thing it have to do with taking a shower? Nothing. 
Uh, and th so those things just aren't being done. So it doesn't have anything to do with the diabetes, right? No, the only thing that ha has to do with the diabetes is being afraid of what will happen to him if we just boot him out the door. Well, but, but I understand that. But you're not making him check his blood sugar. So what's the point of him being at your house? I'm sorry to interrupt. You know no, what? go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no. We, we have had that no. conversation exactly. It used to be I felt good that he was living at home because I could go in there and check his blood sugar. But you don't. But I now mean, he doesn't. But he doesn't let you. So he doesn't what's let the point? Right. Bye-bye, so, Christopher. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what's, this is a diabetic mother to a diabetic mother. She's saying you want him home so he'll do all the things he needs to do, and he's not doing them at home. It used to be he did do it if I wanted him to. Now he doesn't. Well, we're past that then. Yes. All right. Carla, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, you're not interrupting. <laughs> to have Christopher move out and get a full-time job. If I had a full-time job, I'd give it to him. If I had the financial ability, I'd set him up in an apartment and call it a Christmas present. As Christmas father, I want to do whatever it takes to help him. I just don't want to enable him. You're not doing what you're capable of doing with your life, correct? Right. I've changed a lot of stuff recently. I got a part-time job. I do groom myself regularly. Normal progression of things is, you know, kids really kind of cleave on to their parents when they're like one and two and three and four and five and six and they grow up and then when they get into their teen years then they start to get some independence and we have to manage that right right uh, and then as they get older they break away and go out into their own orbit out here and those who don't and they stay in this orbit they tend to resent those people because they really don't want to be he really doesn't want to be living in mommy and daddy's house uh, I have a son now that's 27 and I can promise you it would not work if he was living at home it would not work for us it would not work for him that's my son that's Jordan he is a musician that's him on tour he go and li living at home eh, eh, ain't happening we would cramp his style horribly and no more than he wants us showing up on the tour bus and riding across the country with him. It's time to be apart. Adults split off and be apart. And that's how we feel. Do you agree with that? Yes. 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 Okay, totally. so here's what, let's, let's talk about what we can agree, agree on before the break. Okay. The three of us agree that you don't want to be living at home. You prefer to live on your own, yeah. right? Yeah. You agree with that. In the perfect world, your son would not be living with you at 26. Definitely. Right, definitely. You, you agree with that. Definitely. So we're agreed that that's right. Okay. And we've also agreed earlier that if someone is going to live in your house for any period of time, that they adhere to the house rules because they're a guest. Right. So we've agreed he shouldn't be there and that if under some circumstance he is there, that he should follow the rules of the home in which he is a guest. All right. What will it take to motivate Christopher to move? We'll be right back. Christopher was so drunk that I had to call 911. He was afraid he had alcohol poisoning. He ended up throwing up on her and the couch and the floor. Monday on an all-new Dr. Phil. He says his biggest regret is he ever got you pregnant. A romance on the rocks. Are you sober now? Yes. She says you're not. She's hired somebody to follow you. That's Monday. Well, Christopher's parents say they want to help their son, not hurt him. But it sounds like Christopher isn't doing as much as they think is reasonable to help himself. In the past, I've seen Christopher drunk several times. One time he came home drunk and ripped the towel rack out of the bathroom. There was the time he was so drunk that I had to call 911. We were afraid he had alcohol poisoning. He was very incoherent. My wife was trying to hold him up because he couldn't hold himself up. He ended up throwing up on her and the couch and the floor. I was probably drinking every weekend, and I didn't really think it was a problem until I got a DUI. He's been drunk enough at camping with the family that I no longer go camping with the family if he's there. He's drank excessively at family gatherings at my daughter's wedding on our trip to Mexico. The five of us all went on a cruise to Mexico, and it should have been 
the vacation of a lifetime, but I spent every night worrying about Christopher because he was so drunk. I probably drank every day we were on that cruise. At the end of the cruise, Christopher's bill on his room for the alcohol was over $600. We didn't make him pay for that bill. We haven't really punished him for it. We removed alcohol from the house. We don't enable him. We don't buy him alcohol. In any of those occasions, we do rely on Christopher to make his own limits of alcohol. I'm not going to say you need to go home and kick him to the curb today. Okay, aren't you glad? Yes. Not that you would have done it anyway. But I'm saying that you do need to set up a timeline. The difference between a goal and a dream, you dream of him being out on his own and being healthy. You got to set up for like 30 days here. And during that time, he needs to clean that room and clean his space and respect that house. And if he doesn't, then he chooses to move earlier than the 30 days. That's up to him. You go home and shovel that place out. I would, I would if need be, I would go home, get everything out of that room that's still there. If, it's, if he doesn't clean it up, it goes in the dumpster. Okay. It's gone. Okay? Then I would tear the carpet up there and just leave concrete. I'm, I'm sure it looks nice <laughs> under there. And for that 30 days, you can put a mattress on the concrete and a blanket and a pillow, and that's, that's it. He's not entitled to television and video games and all of this kind of stuff. If he doesn't follow the rules of the house, then you go to the bare minimums here. I am going to offer to get a life coach for him and a family therapist for you to understand what you need to do to move forward here. He needs a plan and accountability to somebody besides the two of you in making that plan work. If you don't have a job, your job is getting a job. And if you have a part-time job and you work 20 hours a week, then your other 20 or 30 hours a week is spent finding a job that will be full-time. You have to begin to behave your way to success. The difference between winners and losers is winners do things losers don't want to do. Entitlement is crippling this country. He needs a plan to get out of this house, and he needs help to do that. And by the way, he is not, he doesn't have brain damage that makes it where he can't think. Uh, he says he wants to be a politician, which he could do with brain damage, but he doesn't. <laughs> But he doesn't have brain damage. But he does like to debate. Huh? He does like to debate. Right. I mean, he's, he's a very bright young man. He's, he's, he's quite intelligent. He's quite capable. He's just gotten into the habit of not being. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like if I have a week off, you'd be amazed how worthless I can get in two or three days. I mean, Robin's in there poking me. Well, you, you know, and they let that turn into weeks, and then weeks turn into months, and months turn into years. You need a plan, but it's got to have a timeline and a goal. Fair enough? Deal? Yes. Deal. All right, we're going to follow up with that, and we're going to let you know how all of this turns out. All right, up next, entitlement is not limited to parents spoiling their children. There's something else that really has me upset, and I'm going to tell you what it is after the break. Breaking news, several Sayreville High School students are arrested and charged in a hazing scandal. Students, all football players, were charged Friday with sexually assaulting and violating four younger teammates in the locker room. We have a lot of fun here in the studio audience. If you're going to be in the Los Angeles area and you would like free tickets, go to drphil.com and click be in the audience. Or you can call 323-461-PHIL. That's 323-461-7445. You know, today we've been talking about entitlement. Unfortunately, it seems to be at epidemic proportions, and it is not limited to just spoiled children living in their parents' basement. It is perhaps nowhere more on display than in the world of athletics. 
The Tallahassee police give Florida State quarterback Jameis Winston special treatment because of his star status. My client is alleging still that he raped her on December 12, 2012. Patricia Carroll says her client cried because prosecutors announced they would not be filing charges against FSU star quarterback Jameis Winston. I'm not focusing on football. Everything's not about football. Sometimes it's just about rape. Breaking news, several Sayreville High School students are arrested arrested and charged in a hazing scandal. Students, all football players, were charged Friday with sexually assaulting and violating four younger teammates during several alleged hazing rituals. We all know what's been going on about players in the NFL, right? But not surprisingly, we are also seeing it at the college level. Case in point, you just saw in the video, Florida State University, number one ranked team in the country, with quarterback and Heisman Trophy winner Jameis Winston is making big headlines off the field with charges of alleged shoplifting, an alleged sexual assault, reportedly being swept under the rug, and allegations of selling autographs and yelling obscenities on campus. He played Saturday. Apparently, he is either not a fast learner or isn't the least bit concerned that he might actually be held to account. And you know what? Apparently, he's right. Hey, coaches, kids are watching. The message should be know the rules and follow them or you will have to go home. Okay? Sadly, even high school is not exempt, as we just saw. Current headlines report that before the homecoming game, seven players from Sayreville High School football team in New Jersey were taken into custody and charged with assault and sex crimes against their own teammates. Now, reportedly, this was not an isolated event. According to reports, it would start with a howling noise from a senior football player and then the locker room lights were abruptly shut off. In the darkness, a freshman football player would be pinned to the locker room floor, his arms and feet held down by multiple upperclassmen. Then the victim would be lifted to his feet and sexually abused. Dozens of people allegedly stood around and watched. Where were the coaches? Where, where were the adults? Why did these players think they were entitled to do such a thing? Do you think the world really gives a damn how fast you can run or how high you can jump? I can tell you I don't. One witness, after the fact, did go to his parents and together they reported the alleged assaults. Superintendent Dr. Richard Levy immediately canceled and forfeited that evening's football game because of serious and unforeseen circumstances. He eventually canceled the entire season. Good for you, doctor. Good for you. Shockingly, or maybe not so shockingly, some parents complained. One mom allegedly said, no one was hurt, no one died. I don't understand why they're being punished. I think the forfeited game was punishment enough. If you seven and all the onlookers did what you're accused of, you have ruined your lives and the lives of your victims, all because you thought you were above the law, or maybe just because you didn't think at all. And coaches, shame on you. Ignorance of what was going on is no excuse. You're not being paid to be ignorant, you're being paid to coach. You're being paid to facilitate the growth of these young men. You blew it. You don't deserve to be a coach. Goodbye. Besides a canceled football season, are these kids in any other trouble? We'll talk about that after the break. We've been talking about entitlement, and I'm saying that it is getting bad when you got football players committing crimes and people saying, oh, no big deal. They run fast. They score touchdowns. Are you kidding? Well, I've invited CNN legal analyst and attorney Sonny Houston to join me via Polycom. Thank you so much, Dr. Phil, for having me. You know this issue is an issue that is very close to my heart. I spent a lot of my prosecutorial career prosecuting child sex crimes, and I think we need to call this Sayreville case what it is. So many people are framing the discussion as a hazing case. We're talking about aggravated sex.
sexual assaults that took place over 10 days and there were four different victims. If we weren't talking about this in the context of a football team, we'd be talking about serial rape and we would all be outraged. Well, Sonny, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up about hazing. I played football in grade school, junior high, high school, and college. And I went through hazing. They shaved our heads. We had to wear these goofy-looking beanies. We had to get up at 2 in the morning and do calisthenics in the freezing rain. You know, nobody got hurt. It was just, it was just part of what you did. This has gone so far beyond that. What, what can and should happen to these young men and the coaches and the parents if these allegations are proven to be true? Well, right now we know that seven of them have been charged with the range of crimes. Their age is 15 to 17, so they're looking at five years in prison, Dr. Phil. But the prosecutor looking at this case, if he charges them at adults, they're looking at a lot more time. They're looking at sexual offender registration for the rest of their lives. Where were the coaches? Where were the administrators? If they were in the locker room, then certainly they need to be charged. Even if they weren't in the locker room, that means they were so grossly negligent in my opinion, that means that they are also responsible for a crime. Uh, it was just a few days ago, I was looking at a great picture of a great young man that is your son in football gear. Yeah. What would you be <laughs> saying and doing if your son came home and had been subjected to this? Certainly, uh, we would be at the police station um, reporting it. We would also be reporting the coaches. We would be reporting the administrators. And I would be speaking to the other parents, my fellow parents. Well said. And look, this is a teachable moment. We need to be teaching these kids that rules apply. And, you know, that's just the difference between stupidity and genius. Stupidity has no limits. Genius does. And this is the stupidest thing I can imagine. Uh, Sonny, I know you've been talking about this on CNN and are going to continue to. Yeah. Let's stay in touch about this and we'll uh, support each other as we raise hell about this uh, happening and see if we can't stop it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. All right, I want to thank all of my guests today. A special thanks to Sonny. We'll see you next time. So long.